evening and welcome to the Marsh Train, your solar performance broadcasting platform. I'm Kristen Scheel from the Marsh. I want to welcome you to a special night of Teledon Please support our performers and live theater by contributing to our Marsh tip jar, which will be linked to the chat throughout the evening. We'd like to welcome our YouTube viewers as well. And if you haven't already, please become a subscriber of our channel, The Marsh Stream, to be notified of shows as they go live. But now please join me in welcoming your hosts of Tell It On Tuesday. Hi. Hello. There, whoo, figured it out. Uh, hi, everyone. We're so excited oh. for you to be here. Can you, hi. <laughs> Normally I don't hear response back. That's great. Um, we're excited for you to be here for our first virtual partnership with StageBridge, but certainly not our first uh, partnership. We've been doing this for 15 years. This has been an annual thing every October. We started in June of 2005, and then I think it was the next October that we started this partnership, but it's been uh, a highlight of our year. So, um, gonna, oh, I've got a lot of background noise. Uh, Bridget, why don't you take it from here and just introduce uh, Clara? Yeah. yeah. So um, we're gonna, uh, we're just gonna take a moment. I'm gonna introduce Clara, um, who's gonna introduce StageBridge, which is kind of the main focus of tonight, not necessarily us until on Tuesday. Um, but uh, yeah, so our, our partnership has been going strong for these last 15 years and we're really excited to uh, welcome Clara. So it's Clara Kamunde and she's the director of storytelling in schools program. And she's been in this position for about um, two years since uh, Kirk Waller, um, moved on to a different position after a long time of being in that position. And Clara has been doing an excellent job. Um, Clara has been with the organization as a teaching artist um, for at least seven or eight years. So she's um, already very familiar with what goes on in StageBridge and she's um, stepped into this role very smoothly. And um, she's pulled together this amazing group of people. So right now we want to introduce Clara and allow her to give a, um, a little warm welcome from StageBridge. It's wonderful to see everybody. Thank you, first of all, to uh, Rebecca and Bridget for this amazing program. And um, I want to say a, uh, a hearty welcome to everybody and uh, particularly to our StageBridge tellers. And for some of you who may not be familiar with StageBridge, our mission is to foster a vibrant community where all lifelong learners are celebrated and enriched through the performing arts. And um, you can learn about uh, more about StageBridge at www dot stagebridge.org and I think of particular interest might be our Performing Arts Institute um, which has um, and in this interesting new time that we're, face we're facing everybody's facing um, we're inviting everybody that's ready to take their talents to the next um, stage um, to uh, visit our website, learn about um, the Performing Arts Institute. And what we do with the Performing Arts Institute is to help everyone um, develop the skills and the confidence that um, they want to build in the performing arts in a fun and supportive uh, community. Uh, Lily Nguyen is our um, director, amazing, amazing um, director of the uh, Performing Arts Institute. And uh, the classes are customized for beginning to advanced students. And we have instructors from um, uh, lots of the prestigious organizations in the Bay Area and beyond actually now we're expanding worldwide. Our reach has become a worldwide reach. So we have acting, dance and movement, improv, directing, playwriting, and of course, storytelling. And um, so again, thank you uh, to uh, Tell It On Tuesday for this amazing opportunity. And please do welcome, uh, we invite you to visit our website to find out more about um, StageBridge. And that's all for me, thank you. All right, great. Well, let's get the show on the road, as we say. Thank you so much, Clara, for that. Um, just hearing that everything is moving along in this virtual world and expanding in many ways that we didn't know would be possible. Um, anyway, so let's do our first performer. And it's going to be Lu uh, Lois Kinsey. And she is performing. Um, well, let me just tell you a little bit about her, Lois. 
is um, uh, has been a clown and is now a writer and teller, a wellness facilitator to a wellness circle of kinship caregivers called I Take Care of Me Too. She has focused on the importance of keeping a life uh, for ourselves as we care for others. As a graduate of the StageBridge EPIC program, she has come to know that any story is a personal story when you find yourself in it. And she is doing the story called uh, Signifying Monkey and Mr. Lion. So let's see, I'm gonna, you unmute it over there? Let me get you. Are you ready? Deep in the jungle, high in the trees lives the signifying monkey. That morning the signifying monkey was swinging in his trees and he looked down and he saw Mr. Lion. Now Mr. Lion had just finished his morning meal and he was feeling quite kingly because after all, as he prowled through his through the jungle, he was the king of this here jungle. Now I'll tell you, Mr. Lion had a smile on his face as big as a lion could smile because he was on his way to his favorite tree where he was going to nap the day away on the nice cool green grass. Now, when Monkey looked down and he saw Mr. Lion, he couldn't help his signifying self. Signifying Monkey, stay up in your tree. You always lying and signifying, but you better not monkey with me. Said the signifying Monkey to the lion one day, good morning, Mr. Lion. Then the lion saw Monkey looked up. He saw him. He said, oh, good morning, Monkey. Because his mind was on his grass, he kept on going. Uh, 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 Mr. Lion, I hear you's the king in every way, but there's a great big elephant down the way who say he go and would and could whip the living day outside. He told me personally. Now, Mr. Lion heard Monkey. Grass went out of his mind. He stopped and he listened to Monkey. Oh, Mr. Lion, I'm sorry to say he's going around talking about your mama in a scandalous way. I mean, he's talking about your mama and he's talking about your grandma too and he ain't showing much respect for you. Who, what? <coughs> oh, Mr. Lion, I'm so glad you weren't there. Because he talked about your mama so long and so bad, it even made me mad. He talking about my mama? I'll find that elephant and I'll fix him. I'll tear that lion from limb from limb. Mr. Lion let out a mighty roar. A mighty roar, more than a lion has ever roared. And he shot off through the jungle like a shot from a 44. Gonna find that lion and tear him bit to bit. Oh. But he found him. Ran up to him. I hear you've been talking about me. I've come to knock you in your own nose. Mr. Elephant, he'd been leaning against a tree trying to get himself a, a righteous nod and he didn't, he's never been awakened so rudely. So it took him a minute, he kind of shook his head, slowly opened his eyes and he looked around. And then he looked down at Mr. Lion in surprise. Boy, you better go on and pick on somebody your own size, oh. <laughs> You know, you and I both know Mr. Lion didn't come to talk. He didn't come to listen. He leaped. I am the king of this jungle. Roared. 
caught the elephant by the throat. The elephant really then cooked him like a goat. And that's when the, ele the monkey, the elephant really went to town. I mean, he whooped that line for the rest of the day. And I still don't know how he got away, but he did. He pulled himself off more dead than alive. Now, monkey, he's swinging in a tree, got to smile all over his face. Because he knew what confusion he'd cause Mr. Lion today. He looked down, he saw Mr. Lion. That monkey could not help his signifying self. Signifying monkey, stay up in your tree. You always lying and signifying, but you better not monkey with me. <laughs> oh, oh, wait, it, what is this bit of mess I see? Is that you lying? Oh, you look more dead than alive. Now, lying feeling more dead than alive. Didn't want to admit to his defeat. Yeah, it's me. <laughs> oh, we he beat your head to a fatty well. Do tell he gave you a whooping that was rough enough. And and you supposed to be the king of the jungle. Ain't you? Ain't that some stuff? You just a you just a, a big old grow a grown pussy cat. <laughs> Now, don't you roar. I don't even think you can eat much rope. And if you did, I'll come down there and whoop your tail some more. Oh, by then the gotcha smile had gotten the monkey. He was jumping up and down and laughing and making fun. And he's jumped high. Gotcha smile still on his face. Come down and his foot missed the limb and he fell bam, flam on the ground. Like a streak of lightning and a ball of heat, the line was on him with all four feet. Monkey, I'm gonna eat you alive. Monkey look up. He looked up with, he looked up at the line with, with tears. I mean, he had real tears in his eyes. He said, oh, Mr. Mr. Lyon, I apologize. I really meant no harm. And if you all, if you just let me go this time, I'll tell you something that you really <laughs> ought to know. Now they say, curiosity gets the cat. Being a cat, what do you think Mr. Lion did? Oh yeah, you're right. He stepped back to hear what the monkey had to say. And that monkey scampered up the tree and got away. And when he was up high enough, he said, what I was trying to tell you, sir, if you mess with me, I'll sick that elephant on you some more and he'll whip your head again. Oh, oh Mr. Mon Mr. Lion. He was beat, beat to his knees. He, he was so full, he couldn't even roar. All he could do was shake his head. His mind went back to his green grass. And with as much growl, oh, you jive monkey. If you and your monkey children want to stay alive, up in them trees, you better stay. <clears throat> and that's why the signifying monkey does his signifying way out the way. Signifying monkey, stay up in your tree. You always lying and signifying, but you better not monkey with me. Uh, it's so much fun. <laughs> uh, thank, you. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Bridget, uh, should I go ahead and introduce um, 
the next one or did you want to? I can't remember way, how we Yeah, did. I've got it here, but. Gotcha, okay. Um, so okay. next we're gonna have Sally Holtzman uh, doing a piece that's entitled Hair Princess. Um, a little bit about Sally. She's had many titles in her lifetime, daughter, wife, teacher, mother, storyteller. Tonight, you will hear of others from the world of make-believe to today's reality. So let's welcome Sally. Hi, I have no picture, am I here? Uh, no, your video is off. It won't start. The host is asking us. Oh, there we go, we see ya. Yay, yay, hello everyone. <laughs> well, in a place not so far away, and a time not so long ago, a princess was born, me. A few hours after my birth, the nurse put me in my daddy's arms and he looked down at that little face and he pulled back the little flannel cap. Oh, mother, our little girl has a crown of brown curls, my princess. And he kissed me right here. Now, I don't know if my mother thought I was a princess, but she certainly liked to fool with my hair. <clears throat> and first it was the little pink bows, and then the barrettes, and then the pigtail, and then the ponytails, and then the pigtails. And every morning she would brush my hair and comb my hair and part my hair and braid my hair and send me off to grammar school. And on the playground, my friend Lucy would gather up my braids and she'd say, Giddy up, Sally, giddy up. And we run around the swing and the slide and the jungle gym up to the classroom door. Whoa. My hair was my crowning glory. Strangers would comment on my hair. And it certainly took up a lot of my mother's interest and time. Sally, go brush your hair, will you? Sally, take your hair out of your face. Sally, stop messing with your hair. Sally. Do something with your hair. And I did. The second day of high school, after the school was finished, I went to the local beautician and I said, cut it. I want it short on the sides. I want it pointed in the back in a DA, which stood for naughtily, duck's ass. That night when my father came home and saw my hair, Tears came to his eyes. What did you do with your hair? I cut it. I, I mean, what did you do with your hair? I put it in the trash can. What? And my father stopped calling me princess. And he never used that title again until the day I was married. And there I was in my beautiful white gown, my hair piled on top of my head, a, a little pearl tiara, veils everywhere. And my father bowed very low and he said, my princess has become a queen. And he put my arm on his and we walked down the aisle so that I could marry my Hungarian husband who certainly knew he was a king. And nine months later, in a couple of days, I had a subject, I had a little girl, a princess. And 20 months later, I had a prince. And 20 months later, I had another prince. And the queen, she was busy, busy, busy. She didn't have time to do her hair or even think about her hair. And then one morning, maybe it was 14 years into my reign, I woke up and looked down on my pillow and there were strands of hair. And I went in the bathroom and brushed my hair. And my goodness, there's a lot of hair in that brush. And then I looked in the mirror, you know, the kind behind the vanity has the lights overhead, looked in my mirror and oh, I could see skin. And the next day when I got up, there was hair on the pillow and hair in the brush and more skin showing. And the third day, I called the Dowager Queen, Mom, Mom, I think I'm losing my hair. Well, Sally, you just take on too many things. I'm sure it's just stress. Do less. The queen does not do less. The queen does more. But by the end of the week, I had traded my crown 
for one of the princess's little league baseball caps. And I sat at the breakfast table. My kingly husband looked at me and he said, do something about your hair. And so I called the wizard, the wizard uh, dermatologist of UCLA and went to see him and came into his office and sat down on a little stool and he looked at my head and he massaged my head. And then he took a book from the, from the bookshelf and opened it up and ran his finger down the list. Tell me, um, do you have any hair on your legs? Uh, no. Do you have any hair on your arms? Uh, no, no. Do you have any hair under your arms? No, I don't. Do you have any hair? No. Well, I must tell you that you have alopecia totalis. That sounds terrible. What, what is it? It means total hair loss. Well, do you have a serum or a potion or, or something you can give me? I'll write you a prescription. Well, you can imagine how I felt as I drove home. I mean, my heart was beating. By the time I got in, into my house, I ran up to the bathroom. I looked into that mirror, the one you know behind the vanity. The lights were shining and I looked and what did I see? I saw this nose and these buck teeth and a shiny head, no hair. And I thought, you are ugly, you are so ugly. And then, bing. Now, I don't know if it was a fairy, a fairy voice or my subconscious or my mother's voice, but some voice said to me, you are not your nose. You are not your teeth. You are not your hair. You have a kingdom to run. Go out there and do something. And so I did. I bought wigs long wigs and short wigs and curly wigs and straight wigs, but the wig that I liked the best was the one from DuPont. It was a synthetic wig and you could do anything in that wig. You could swim in that wig, you could sleep in that wig and not a hair would be out of place. But it was while wearing that wig that I lost my crown, so to speak. Now I was a senior Girl Scout leader and I was in the park with my Girl Scouts. We were playing volleyball. And I went up to spike the ball with the girl next to me and her fingers caught in my wig, sent that wig flying over the net and it landed at the opposition's feet. And all the girls gathered round and looked down at this brown fair, fairy, furry thing, kind of looked like roadkill. And then one of the girls got brave enough and she picked it up and she said, is this yours? And with all the dignity that I can manage as a queen, I put it back on my bald head. And then the questions began. Are you sick? Is it are you contagious? When did you lose your hair? Hair, how many wigs do you have? Well, I have about five or six. Five or six wigs. Oh, that is so cool. My mother won't even let me have an extension. And that is how I became the queen of cool. I would be in the grocery store and one of my Girl Scouts would pass me and she would go, so cool, so cool. And then the queen and then the years passed and uh, she was busy, busy, busy. And, and but, but decided that she would take a little break and maybe go to a movie matinee. And that is where the queen got her next title. She walked into the movie and there was this little teenage cashier, you know, the one behind the candy counter. And she said to me, would you like a senior citizen ticket? Senior citizen ticket? Senior citizen? See, uh, well, I bought the ticket and I rushed into the ladies room to consult the mirror. They must have a mirror there, you know, behind the, 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 the basin. And I looked in that mirror and do you know what I saw? I saw this nose, and these teeth, and wrinkles, wrinkles. I couldn't believe it. And then ding, there was the little voice. And the little voice said, you're gonna love being a senior citizen. Why you get free parking and you get special seats and you get discount on food and travel and everything. And you can join your local senior center in AARP. And there's a senior theater called Stage Bridge. You could join that too. And you will be busy, busy, busy. 
and I was busy, busy, busy. And the years just sort of flew by and then it was 2000 and then it was 2020 and a virus came over the land. And the queen's children, the prince, princess and the two princes came to the castle. They were very concerned about the queen who was now quite elderly and had been given the title of elder. And she was told to sequester in her castle. Sequestered elder, sequestered elder. What kind of a title is that? And I went to my bathroom to look into my magic mirror and I turned on the mirror on the lights above the mirror and I looked in and you know what I saw? I saw this nose and this teeth and this wrinkle and this wrinkle and this wrinkle and this wrinkle and I thought to myself, oh, to hell with it, just put on a mask. <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, that was great fun. Thank you. Thank you, Sally. Thank you. <laughs> uh, um, before I, we have the last two performers, as stories. And um, I just want to remind everyone this we're so lucky that the marshes continued going into the virtual world. And the way that these programs are sustained is by contributing. There's a tip jar, which is um, uh, uh, oh, I'm gonna have um, Kristen maybe uh, put that in the chat. I'm not sure how to put that in there right this minute. But it's any donation is is wonderful. And it, it's sustaining the marsh during these times. So just wanted to plug that. All right, uh, next, next storyteller is Rose Owens, and she is a storyteller, writer, and artist, mother to seven children and grandmother to 25 grandchildren. She tells family stories, original stories, and her own adaption of folk and fairy tales, has published the, has published the Mary Elise Trilogy, three middle grade fantasy novels, and has a master's degree in special education. And tonight her story is called My Father Goes a Courting. Let's welcome her. Thank you. And you can hear me? My Father Goes a Courting. People talk. You know they do. And the year that I was 10, people in Vernal, Utah, talked a lot about our family. Have you heard? Ella Durfee's getting married again. Really? How long ago was it that her husband died? Oh, it was over a year ago. He fell down the mine shaft at the Giltonite mine. Oh, the poor man, he didn't have a chance. And he left her with five children to raise all by herself. Who is she married? Mark Pope. His wife died last February left him with 11 children and the youngest a baby only hours old. Oh, those poor motherless children. I should know. I was one of those poor motherless children. Now, when my aunts, my father's sisters, heard that my mother had died, they began to talk to each other. My goodness, how is Mark going to manage? He'll never be able to manage. We have to help him. And they came up with a plan. And they came out to Vernal with their lightly packed suitcases and explained to my father that each one of them would take one or two of the younger children back to Salt Lake with them. My father listened and then he said, no, this family stays together. And after my mother's funeral, my aunts took their lightly packed suitcases and went back to Salt Lake. And we began to figure out how to manage without our mother. Now that first summer, Larry, age 13, was the oldest one at home. All of our older brothers and sisters were working. And so he was in charge of running the farm. And with the help of my sister, Ruby, who was 12, he supervised the younger children, myself, Russell, Eileen, and Mark J. Now we always raised a big vegetable garden. And when it was our turn for water, Larry would go and get the irrigation water and I would wade in the irrigation ditch, but I had to help too. And so I would help, I helped to irrigate the garden. I helped to weed the garden. I helped to pick the produce. I helped to can and freeze the produce for the winter. Now on Thursday, we did the washing on a ringer washing machine. 
Now, our washing machine, a Dexter twin tub, was top of the line. It had two tubs for agitating. It'd agitate the clothes, and you'd feed them through the ringer into the second wash water, and it would agitate the clothes. Then you'd take a hold of the ringer, and you'd swing it around so that you could feed the clothes through and into the first rinse water. And like those, into the second rinse water. And then we would take those clothes and hang them on the line and let them dry in the sunshine. And then we would gather them in and fold them up and put them away. I, helped, I was in charge of feeding chickens and gathering eggs. And Larry milked the cows and fed the animals. Now on Sunday, we went to church. Now our baby brother, Ross, who had been born the day that my mother died, was, had been born two, two months early. And one of my mother's cousins, Marjorie Bingham, had come to my dad and she'd said, Mark, I will take care of that little baby for you until you can make other arrangements. And she did. And on Sunday, when we went to church, the Pope children would go rushing over to the Binghams to see our baby. And our Eileen, who was five, would say, his name's Ross Pope. And their Eileen, who was also five, would say, his name's Ross Popey Bingham, and he'll be Ross Popey Bingham until you take him home. Now, supervising children and shopping and making sure meals were served and laundry and working full time was overwhelming for my father. And he decided that he needed to do something about that. He was not going to bring Ross home until he had someone to take care of him. And every one of the hired them he, hired, he interviewed for housekeeping that he was willing to hire were not willing to work for a family of that size. And so he considered and he thought what he really needed was a wife. <coughs> so I commenced, he said, to think of all the widow women of my acquaintance. And I thought of Ella Durfee. Now, Ella Durfee and her husband had built a set of apartments on their house, attached to their house in Vernal, Utah. And Ella helped with the carpentry. She helped with the electrical. She helped with the plumbing. She helped with the painting. She helped with the wallpapering. She upholstered furniture. Whatever needed doing, she helped do. And after Morris died, she continued to manage those apartments with the help of her teenage children. Now, on the day that my dad went to ask her out for a date, she was up on the roof fixing it with her teenage son. At this time in her life, Ella always wore a dress. And that's not exactly appropriate attire for being up on the roof with your teenage son. So she took a pair of her first husband's bib overalls and she put them on and she stuffed that dress down inside. And when my father came to ask her out on a date, she was beyond embarrassed. She was mortified and she would not come down. So he had to ask her out another time. So he called her on the phone and he thought, well, maybe mentioning marriage on the phone wasn't a good idea. So he asked her out on a date and she accepted. And he took her out to dinner and they talked about this and they talked about that. And then he said, Ella, would you be willing to come up to my house during the week and take care of my two little boys? Ross is six months old and Mark J is almost three. Ella did not hesitate to speak her mind. I ain't a gonna do it. I ain't a gonna do it. I'd fall in love with those boys and they wouldn't be mine. And then my father said, well, I'm not interested in dating for the sake of dating. But if you'd care to step out with me with a view to matrimony, I'd like to take you out again. And she accepted and they began to date. Now, there was a bit of a role reversal at the Durfee house. Ella's teenage children, Reed and Lorraine, worried about their mother, who was now in the dating scene. One night, they drove around and they went to every single place that they knew that the teenagers went to park and neck. But they never found them. Now, perhaps that's because they did a lot of their dating in Roosevelt, Utah, which was 30 miles away because they knew that people talked and they didn't want people to talk about them until they knew how this was going to work out. Eventually, eventually, one night, Lorraine was waiting for her mom to come home and she heard the car come up outside the house and she waited and she waited 
and she waited. And she went to the door and she opened the door and she peeked out and they were standing out there on the sidewalk. And they were kissing. And she shut the door and went back inside and waited some more. And when, when her mother came in the door, she said, Mama, do you know what that leads to? Lorraine was right. Kissing does lead to an engagement. And Mark and Ella became engaged and people began to talk. And when Ella's older brother, Ralph, heard the news, he came stomping down the lane to her house and he said, Ella, do you know how many kids that man has? You'd be crazy to marry him. And one of my aunts said, she's either an angel or she's crazy. And Ella told me later, she said, I knew I wasn't an angel, but I didn't think I was crazy either. But Mark and Ella didn't pay any attention to what people were saying. They just went ahead and got married. And then they began the process of figuring out how to merge two families into one. And they succeeded. In fact, it was 30 years later before they admitted that it was a marriage of convenience and the love came later. But the evidence that she, they succeeded is the fact that 30 years after they're gone, the children, all 16 children in the Pope Durfee family are still united. And that is the story of how my father went courting. Thank you. Uh, I just, every time you say 16 children, I lo love that, the expanded Brady Bunch. <laughs> yeah, that's so impressive. <laughs> Thank you. Nice work. That was really lovely, Rose. Thank you. So our final performer this evening is uh, Claire Isaacs Warhoftig, and she's going to be performing a piece entitled I Love You, San Francisco. And I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Claire. So after retiring from a career in arts administration, she started studying storytelling at Stagebridge. Just when she thinks she's out of stories, one pops up in her subconscious, and it is a thrill to share. So let's um, welcome Claire performing I Love You, San Francisco. Is her volume on? Oh, I can't hear you. Here we are. Hello, everybody. Hello, Rebecca. I think we're set here, thank you. Well, I was comfortably ensconced at my desk at the San Francisco Arts Commission when the door opened and Frank Pietro Negro just burst into the place with his hands fluttering around. He says, I've got it, I know what to do. We're gonna have a float in the gay pride parade. I looked at him and I said, what? Well, you see, Frank was in charge of our annual arts festival and we needed publicity and I see what he was getting at, but the bureaucrat in me began to think hard. Are any other departments of the city of San Francisco in the pride parade? The police? No way. They're guarding them. Reckon Park is too busy running programs in the parks. Uh, let's see. Public works wouldn't be doing, they're gonna clean up afterwards. The airport, no, they're too far away. They're not part of this. How about adult parole, probation? That's a big department, but I don't think they're here. So I thought, well, what the heck, why not? Frank, let's do it. Now, the question is, what's gonna be on the float? And Frank said, well, gay and lesbian performers and artists, of course. I'm gonna be Leonardo. I said, oh my goodness. And I could see him already in his puffy pants and with the feather in the hat and with probably a palette and a, and a brush in his hands to be Leonardo da Vinci. And he said, and what are you gonna be? I am supposed to ride in his float. I'm supposed to be somebody. And I thought, oh my gosh, I don't know. I don't know what I'm supposed to be. And then all of a sudden it came to me. I've got it. I'm going to be Gertrude Stein, 
the great poet from San Francisco who spent time in Paris with Picasso and all those avant-garde people whose attitude towards Oakland was to say, there's no there there. And I thought, how am I gonna look like? I mean, how am I gonna be this particular person? Then I remembered in my art history book, I had a great portrait of uh, Gertrude Stein painted by Picasso. It was very small, that so big, just showed her from the waist up. But she was wearing a black coat and a white blouse. And I assumed she was wearing a black skirt. Uh, and at her neck was a red brooch. None of this was too hard to find and get dressed up, but I had to consider the face. What am I going to do? So I went down to theatrical supply and I rented a black wig, big thing, because that's what she was, black haired. And then I looked at the face and I looked at that portrait. Now this is a portrait by Picasso. It wasn't your everyday portrait. And he had different lines and shapes and the face. And I took the makeup and I remembered all my training. And I said, I can do this. I can use yellow and blue and make parts recede and parts come out. It won't be too bad. But there's really one big problem. And that's the eyes. You know, our eyes are, you know, they're on a straight line, right? Well, in the Picasso, they were on different lines. You had two different eyes on, different, on a different radius. And how do you do that without having plastic surgery? Well, I couldn't do that. So I did the best with makeup. And the point is, I really did look different anyway. So the big day came <clears throat> and went downtown to where they were loading. And it was fabulous. There were all the drag queens in their gorgeous, gorgeous outfits and the dykes on bikes revving up and people in the most beautiful clothes. It was really beautiful. I could see this was going to be quite an event. And then I, for some reason, my mother shows up. I had no idea why she came down there. She Maybe she hoped to find me. And I was stunned and I went up to her and I didn't say anything. And she said, who are you? And then I knew the makeup was pretty good because she didn't recognize her own daughter. And I'm gonna tell you something, by the way, if you wanna see what your mother looks like when she doesn't know who you are, it's a completely different look than when she's your mother. <laughs> it was really funny. So I said, hi, mom. And she nearly plots. <laughs> it was funny. So I got on board and we started going up Market Street. And it was a very, uh, it was wonderful. There were just thousands of people on either side of the float, people going up the way. And then all of a sudden people were throwing roses at me and I couldn't figure out and I grabbed one and so I sort of pretended to be sort of giving them like a scepter, you know, the queenly wave and all that sort of thing. And then I realized, of course, what was she famous for? Her so-called poem, which was a rose is a rose is a rose is a rose is a rose. And that's what people were doing. And somehow they seemed to know I was going to show up at this and I didn't know how, but it was a wonderful day. This costume worked, the face worked, and everybody had a good time and we publicized the annual arts festival to take place a month later. I got to Civic Center, I got out, got in my car, and I got home and someone said, didn't you know you were in Herb Cain's column today? Herb Cain was a famous journalist, dot, three dot journalist of, for 50 years in San Francisco. Nobody who lived in San Francisco and took the Chronicle started the day without turning first to the back page of the first section where there was a Herb Cain column. And what it said was, somebody had leaked this to the press. It said, Claire Isaacs is the director of the Arts Commission and she's riding in the Gay Pride Parade and she's going as Gertrude Stein. That's how everybody knew. And but she's, ma she's married, but not gay, dot, dot, dot. She's about to be married, dot, 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 to a man. And that's how my engagement got noticed all over San Francisco because I hadn't told anybody about it. Well, that was pretty wild. The next day was Monday morning. Now you must understand that Mayor Dianne Feinstein at that time would have a very serious meeting at nine o'clock probably on Monday morning. All the department heads came and it was kind of a municipal West Wing, if you can imagine. It was very interesting, but I thought, I'm probably going to get it now. Probably people maybe didn't approve of this. Well, what do you know? I came and everybody was giving me high fives and slapping my hand and saying it was fantastic. Wish we had done something like that. That was really great. And I thought, 
What a great thing. What a great thing to have been in something like that and to have everybody think so well of me. And all I can say to end this is, I love you, San Francisco. Yay. Thank you, Claire. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I love the range of stories. I was just thinking how, um, how the Lois started the night and then here we, uh, you know, doing a, just the range of story that kind of how we traversed through all different types of ways of telling stories. Um, anyway, that was great. Um, hold on, um, excuse me. So um, it, anyway, did anyone, uh, before we, you know, uh, I want to thank everyone for being here. If anything that was upcoming with Stage Bridge that we wanted to hear about, Clara? Um, yes, well, uh, you know, coming up pretty shortly is um, the uh, lunchtime storytelling. And um, the next one is, let me get the exact date. Um, it's always the third Thursday, and I'll get you the, e, let me see where it, I had that up somewhere. Oh. Is it on your website? It's on the website. Yeah. So, but yeah, so coming yes, up on 19th, November 19th. Yes, exactly. That's it. Okay. That's great. Yeah. Who's the teller? And who's the teller? Um, we haven't, um, we haven't finalized the list yet. So that'll be uh, announced shortly. Well, I want to encourage everyone, you know, we're coming up to the end of the year and all of these arts, arts organizations need support. So I've got done my plug for the Marsh, but I want to also give my plug for Stage Bridge. I'm sure that you're open and welcome uh, for, for donations as well. So, oh, wait. <laughs> so uh, just while you're on your computer, um, you know, think of the Marsh and Stage Bridge because these are organizations that are, you know, plodding along through the virtual experience. And there are organizations that we want to see emerge from this, right? Yeah, exactly. So let's, uh, let's thank Rose, Sally, Lois, and Claire. And um, I just think that was a really, really, really enjoyable night. And yeah. I, uh, in turn, want to thank Bridget and, and Rebecca for putting this together and for our continued partnership. I, we really do appreciate it. Yay, 15 years. Yeah, going Yay. strong. All right, we'll see you next month, everyone. All okay, right. wonderful. November 24th. See you then. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bridget, and thank you, Rebecca. And uh, that was a wonderful evening. I have to say that was some of the best storytelling I've seen. Uh, on the Marsh stream in a long time. It was really fun and I hope to see more uh, stage bridge performers. Thanks so much and have a great evening, everybody.